fish are incredibly diverse. In fact, they are the most diverse or species vertebrate in the world, with over 30,000 species filling almost every open expanse, crevice, and coral reef under the waterline. Fish have been pushed into evolving into so many forms to fulfill the requirements of the many different habitats they exist in, and few fish groups show this versatility as much as the rays. They have such an extreme form of the usual fish body plan that they have basically lost most defining fish features, evolving wings and gliding through the water. And then they took this unique body plan and diversified into many different forms themselves, developing venomous spines or even evolving into giant filter feeders. Rays are basically very highly modified fish, where the normal torpedo body shape has been adapted to the point where they are barely recognisable as fish anymore, where it may be difficult to even see how they are related to fish, or vertebrates in general. But looking at their skeletons, rays actually have all of the normal features of the vertebrate body plan, like a defined skull, forelimbs, hind limbs, and a tail. They are just arranged in a very strange way. However, how they developed from a more normal fish body shape to their current form is not so well known. Rays are in a very large group of fish known as the chondrichthys, which also contain sharks, and which differ from the bony fish in having skeletons that are made out of cartilage. Specifically, rays are in a group of fish called batoidia, that contains rays and all of their closest relatives. And the batoids form a sister group to the sharks, with DNA evidence showing that the rays and sharks last had a common ancestor between 200 and 250 million years ago in the Triassic period. This is a very long time ago, but the cartilaginous chondrichthys fish are over 400 million years old, and there are still living members of this group that separated from sharks even longer ago, like ghost fish for example. The chondrichthys cartilaginous skeleton has advantages over bone, like being more flexible and lighter, but it isn't as tough so it disintegrates faster than bone and is a lot easier for other animals to eat, meaning that a cartilage skeleton is much less likely to reach the point where it can begin to fossilise. However, like sharks, batoid teeth are made out of much tougher materials, and so can easily fossilise, and so like many prehistoric sharks, their teeth tend to get turned into fossils, but their body is lost to time. The oldest evidence of rays in the fossil record are from some 183 million year old isolated teeth, but very few prehistoric ray bodies have been discovered, so little is known about what they looked like, and so how they change from more normal looking fish to having the body shapes they have today. However, the scant fossils that are available can still offer some clues. One of the oldest complete batoid fossils known was called Spathobatis, that has teeth known from many parts of Europe from the mid-Jurassic period. At this time, what would eventually become modern day Europe was a string of tropical islands probably similar to Indonesia, and this fish would have made its home in the shallows between the dotted islands. Spathobatis was quite small, which was likely the case for most batoids from around this time, and so would have had to have dodged being eaten by sharks and marine reptiles like ichthyosaurs, that were the dominant predators of the time. Spathobatis shared many features with rays, like having eyes poking out the top of a much wider head, instead of on their side like other fish, and its mouth and gill slits were on its underside. However, it still had a well-defined tail with a tail fin, so it looked a bit like a fish crossed with a ray, showing a transition. Spathobatis probably looked a lot like a group of fish called Rhinopristiforms, also known as the shovel-nosed rays, that are also batoids and related to the rays, and also contain the sawfish, and so the fossil of Spathobatis shows that the shovel-nosed rays may be the most primitive member of the group. There was also a group of prehistoric batoids named the Sclerorhynchoids, they have now gone entirely extinct, but were very common during the early and mid Cretaceous period, about 100 million years ago, and they would have been some of the largest fish at the time as well. One sclerorhynchoid was called Onchopristes, it's only known from fossils of its barbs and saw, but scaling it up using the size of its relatives for reference would mean that it could have grown to around 8 to 10 meters long. Also, its fossilized barbs have been discovered in what would have been freshwater ecosystems, so like modern day sawfish, it most likely swam up rivers and into lakes as well. Sclerorhynchoids looked a lot like sawfish, but they were actually more closely related to skates, which are very closely related to rays, and probably would have looked like a slightly wider sawfish in the flesh. So this shows that rays evolved from animals that looked more like shovel-nosed rays, 
but their front fins became larger and larger, while their tail shrunk down in size like a skate, until eventually losing their tail fin altogether. Spathobatis had very flat teeth that looked similar to the teeth of shovel nose rays, which largely eat shellfish, benthic fish, and other creatures that inhabit shallow seabeds. So like most modern batoids, Spathobatis probably hunted at the seabed, which is why these creatures have developed their strange body shapes. Just like sharks, all batoids are capable of the type of sense known as electroreception, where they can detect the electrical signals in their prey, and this ability is uniquely effective in catching creatures that dwell near the bottom of the sea, because they can still be detected even if buried under the sand. Modern rays have most of their electroreceptors dotted throughout their front half of their body, including their wings. So if early batoids spent their time trying to detect creatures hidden in the sand, it is easy to see how there would be a selective pressure to increase the area it could cover, and over time would evolve to enlarge in its head and fins. Adding to this, a flatter body would increase its ability to blend in or bury itself under the sand and stay hidden from predators above. The reason why Ray specifically lost their tail altogether seems to be as their front fins became larger and larger, evolution would continue to make this change profitable in other ways, until it became very dominant in their swimming. After a long enough time, the tail became unnecessary for locomotion, and so was minimized, or in the case of stingrays, modified for defense. The problem is that many modern rays are no longer just bottom feeders, and are actually now very good swimmers, and have adapted to live and swim in the open oceans. Rays swim in a motion known as dorsal ventral oscillation, which basically is a very similar process to how a bird flaps its wings, just pushing through the water rather than the air. It looks quite unusual compared to the way a fish swims, but fairly recent study has found that the way that rays swim is actually highly efficient, and in fact is comparably efficient to the way a conventional fish swims, and actually significantly more efficient than the way an eel swims. So it seems that when a niche opened up that required more open ocean swimming, it just happened that the ray body shape is actually comparably good to a normal fish for efficient swimming. So although the wings and wider flatter bodies of these creatures may have evolved in an effort to aid them in catching obscure prey, it didn't hinder them in living in different ways, which is why rays are so diverse today. So diverse that some batoids even adapted to become giant filter feeders and become some of the largest fish found in the oceans. Krill grow faster in colder temperatures, and about 30 million years ago, the Earth's oceans started to cool due to there being an uninterrupted flow of water around Antarctica due to the continent shifting, creating great conditions for krill. DNA evidence shows that manta rays first evolved about 20 million years ago, and this is also around the time that all of the giant filter feeders first appear in the fossil record, like filter feeding sharks and baleen whales. So it is thought that the increase of krill encouraged the evolution of giant filter feeding animals, and rays may have just been in the right place at the right time in order to adapt into a filter feeding niche. Or maybe not. One often overlooked aspect about rays that is usually obscured by their unusual physical features is that they are also quite intelligent, having the largest brain to body size of any fish, with the brain of a manta ray being 10 times the size of a whale shark brain for comparison. So although their surprisingly high intelligence may not be very well studied, it could have offered them an edge in dominating the oceans and becoming so diverse. Thank you for watching. A big thank you goes to all my patrons, especially the big contributors that are listed here. If you like content like this, then consider becoming a patron as well.